Well, hello. Hi. I've been sitting all morning, so I'm going to stand if that's okay with you, because you're not really here to see or hear me. I'll sit and be quiet later, and you're here to see them. Um, I got to put this panel together, and I was very excited about it, because, uh, so I'm Timmy Ginn, I'm the moderator, um, panelists, uh, I will introduce in a second. But I got really excited about this because I'm late in life to teaching. I spent a lot of time in the production world, and uh, when it was taught, to start creating you know, a conversation about how, what do we create, how do we develop creators, how do we get them to take a leadership role in creating content. You know, it was fun for me to, I mean this in a professional way, fun for me to talk with other educators and their different perspective. And what's great is you know, three different major institutions represented. Um, from the problem from Champaign College, when I was, I just forgot your middle name. David Jewell. David Jewell. Um, I see I should just read his name over there. I, I was like, it's right him, But I wanted to look at him yeah, <laughs> from UVM <laughs> and Megan Beach <laughs> from Vermont State University. Full disclosure, Megan is my sort of boss. She's the department chair that I yeah. teach in at over there. Yeah. Actually, we all have the same <laughs> boss, which is, well, it used to be Mike Smith. Uh, <laughs> we're now under our fourth president. <laughs> my ninth, so I've lost track. Okay, so <clears> ninth, you know. lost track, and we've only been there a week and a half. Um, what's great about this is they all focus in and around the use of video production in a variety of different ways that engage the community, whether it's through news, whether it's through creative <clears throat> arts, whether it's through social activism. So to talk about creating le leaders that utilize the infrastructure, they're developing the students who then become your staffers, your colleagues, your interns at your community media station. Um, so. I will mention a few things about them and let them sort of fill in the gap of introduction. I gotta try not to make so read people's bios or make them give speeches. Um, so I'll start with um, maybe the person I know the least about, um, but I've learned a lot about in the last 48 hours. Um, Miles um, really focuses in and around uh, and been working on a documentary around the history of CCTV and uh, the true activism that community media can have, right? Changing the way people make decisions, uh, the way they feel about issues, educating them, informing them, engaging them. Um, I had actually an opportunity, uh, very uh, politely, he asked to interview me, and we were talking about what does community media really sort of mean to me, and I came from the evil corporate broadcast side, right? I worked for networks and for stations, and there was always someone sort of making the decision for you because they had to make their case to make that content to a sponsor, to a ratings number, to an ad agency. And so to be able to sort of create content where none of those shackles are on you and making those decisions and be able to make create content that really was about what people were thinking about, what they want to say, and have that production not have any controls on it. Yeah, that was really refreshing to have that conversation with them. Miles, talk a little bit about how long you've been at UVM and sort of what's your focus there. Yeah, uh, so teaching at the University of Vermont, I uh, got a full-time hire, started in 2020, so was adjuncting since 2017 and kind of been split between a few different departments. So there's a public communications department that goes by the name of Community Development and Applied Economics. So there's a visual design track in that program and, and it uh, builds itself as a social science. So we're housed alongside other sciences um, in the College of Ag Life, um, but also working in film and television studies, which is your traditional film theory, criticism and production. Um, so it's a kind of a interdisciplinary approach um, and a lot of stuff that we te that I teach there is um, uh, classes called documentaries for social change, uh, community media production, sports media, as well as video production and animation, which would be over in the film and television studies. And a lot of this comes with the lens of how do you how does this work build community, as well as the kind of ethics of representation. And I think we're really seeing a, a strong push. Um, from the younger generation to understand what it means to turn cameras on people, the age of misinformation, the crafting of identity in social media. And so we're kind of seeing folks looking for something um, that maybe feel, even though for a lot of us here, this is really kind of 
um, been tried and true, but is a little bit more refreshing to a younger audience to learn about community media and learn about long form documenting and um, uh, this kind of more civically minded work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Gordon Goddard from Champlain College. I, I had a chance to talk with him because I had connected with some of their leadership. Um, I serve uh, another organization for the Little Canada Business Council and have had conversations with the leadership about reigniting or supporting more of their comp campaign, their, their uh, campuses in Montreal. Um, so uh, when talking with uh, Lisa Tiffin, who's your colleague in government administration, whatever her title is there, um, I was talking to her about folks in this content, and she immediately said, you got to talk to Gordon. Um, took a look at some of the stuff that you creatively do online, um, really sort of try to drive art and creativity into the messaging. Um, so tell everybody a little bit about what you've been working on, what you've been doing, and, and sort of your half CV-ish, like yeah. the way Miles did, <laughs> right? Um, I'm Gordon, I'm at Champlain College. Um, <clears throat> I teach, my area is called creative media, and um, students can major in that. Um, Champlain kind of markets itself as a uh, very job placement, career oriented place. And um, over the last, since I've been there since 2008, um, the game program there has really taken off. So if you know anything about Champlain, um, it used to be kind of a, very, uh, a, a big business school and the creative, the creative arts have kind of just grown and grown and grown as business has kind of leveled out. And so, um, the game is it, the game program draws a lot of students. It's one of the, it's it's been for years one of the highest ranked game programs. It's not my area. Um, there's a film program, graphic design, um, and so um, I've taught a lot in the film and broadcast area. Um, but I was hired to do creative media, which is students that maybe don't want to specialize in graphic design only, because uh, most of those career track programs are very kind of rigid and very focused on placing people in specific industrial situations like the game the game industry is they want a certain kind of you know prep and same thing with film production and graphic design and so sometimes students are like well i want a little bit more freedom to combine graphic design and creative writing or interactivity and animation mm -hmm. and so um i have this like sort of bad news bears group of people that are all doing different things <laughs> um right and my approach in my whole career uh, in production has been skewed heavily towards media for social change, what I, what I call media activism, which I'm a little worried it can be dated, depending on people that understand what I mean by that and how much explanation it needs. Yeah. Um, and so it's a challenge for me is trying to uh, create curriculum, new curriculum that is oriented that way, that's media for so social change. That's what I'm about right now, like trying to make it either a major or a concentration um, and combination of draw the students that are already there that are so inclined to do that kind of work and also attract the students that I know that are out there. Um, you know, my motivator is when I look at the news every single day, I just think uh, there's, there's work to be done. There's so much social change work to be done now more than ever. And in, in, a, in a landscape where, you know, the results of digital convergence have meant a, a a shifting or a collapse in what we have traditionally thought of as journalism, whether it's print journalism or um, televised journalism. You know, my students now are speaking a completely different language, visually, socially, and so like our ideas about what we grew up with 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 print and television journalism, it, it, it's not that way anymore. And and I'm thinking, you know, in the next five, ten years, when they're out in the world, not only are the 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 work that is going to require social change is going to be banging hard, and I think that the way the way to make those changes involves media, and so that's I'm trying to kind of take students and point them in that direction and say, look, any problem that is coming down is going to involve uh, organization, which is going to involve media, whatever that means now. Because you need to make your case for whatever issue. Yeah, and understand like that it, it maybe it's not newspapers anymore, and it's not TV news anymore. Um, you save that for more of our vibrant conversation. But thank you for yeah. introducing yourself. Uh, last is uh, 
Peggy Meacham, um, Park Chair at uh, Vermont State University, um, oversees News 7 at Linden. Um, when I first started teaching there on the visual arts side, teaching more video production and editing and things like that, I got a good understanding of News 7 as the sort of the, the way it was referenced as well by Jody Freed yesterday that the only sort of news outlet that existed in the Northeast Kingdom, because it's in that gray area of its you know, not Montreal, it's not Burlington, it's not Manchester. Um, so, um, Donna talked a little bit about Darlene and Dave and that creation. So, Megan oversees the station there now with the transformation. Um, you can tell everybody else what you oversee because it moved too fast for me. <laughs> sure. Vermont State University is <laughs> Lyndon, Johnson, Castleton, and the two campuses of Vermont Tech were one big soon to be happy family. No, we are a happy Maybe. family. I don't, I mean, there are days. Um, <laughs> it, we're still in transition. Um, so yeah, I'm on the Linden campus uh, and the communications program on Linden's campus uh, turned 50 years old uh, last year. Uh, so there's a really rich history of media uh, and community media in particular, the community media part of what Linden's campus has always been a part of uh, turns 50 in two years. Uh, so not that I'm counting, uh, the countdown is on. Uh, 50, oh, 48 years ago, we launched uh, the news station uh, that serves 14 communities uh, around our campus. Uh, we use the public access cable channel as our vehicle. Obviously, now that you know consumers have changed, we're also streaming on social media because there's more cutting of the cable line. And so there's got to be an acknowledgement of how people access information. Um, but so we've got students uh, in a newsroom, which pretty much operates like any newsroom over here in Burlington. Uh, hours can range from eight to 10, eight in the morning till 10 at night, depending on uh, students sort of schedules with their classes and, and how many credits they're actually in the newsroom for. Um, but we're, we're a pre-professional program that tries to mimic reality. Um, but we are 100% sort of merging ourselves into other platforms. We are constantly on social media. We are developing or well, have been developing a podcast uh, that reaches parts of our uh, community and sort of, sort of more long form community conversation, um, topics that are important to the region that in a broadcast uh, setting would only get two minutes. Um, we're sort of making it so that they're getting 20 to 30 instead. Um, and really honing in on how the next generation of consumer is consuming news and information and making sure that um, we're, we're acknowledging that, but also acknowledging the limitations of the community in which we serve, um, as the kingdom is not super well connected with high-speed internet. And there are a lot of people who still depend on those old-fashioned ways of gathering information. And I say old fashioned sometimes in my head with quotes because they're not that old fashioned. <laughs> um, I also work with a lot of uh, cinema production students uh, who are sort of telling those types of stories um, in, a, in a more documentary style lens. Uh, and I also work with what we call new media students uh, sort of in that PR marketing social media space and how we communicate all these things in short bursts across different platforms. So I'm everywhere and in between. Tim, that's that's my answer. <laughs> and yeah. so um, thank you for your um, engaging introductions. Um, what I like to do is I don't like the panel just to be, we're all going to talk at you. So I'm going to moderate a discussion. If you want to engage in that topic, just raise your hand. And, and, and questions are good, comments are tolerated. Um, um, but I am going to definitely leave time at the end for general Q&A if you're just so enthralled that you don't want to interrupt the conversation that's going on. I, I hope uh, that happens. Um, so let's, let's start with sort of a really crazy question, but why are you here? Why did you want to come talk about this topic? Why is it so important to you that when I asked you to do this, you took time out of your busy days and demanding students? Um, you know, why is this an important discussion to have when we're thinking about what are the next generation of folks that we're developing and, and you know, maybe a tip into some of the ways that you think about your curriculum to train them, educate them, engage them. I'll just toss that out of whoever wants to jump in first. If you want me to force someone to answer, I can say, what do you think? I, I mean, I can start. Hey, okay. I don't mind starting. 
Um, the problem with starting, though, is I always get other ideas as other people talk. So <laughs> that's the downside of you going to get it. Yeah. Uh, Woohoo. Um, so one of the things I really love about the community media conversation is this is sort of it's been a conversation that shifted, especially since COVID um, and sort of how we all depend on media platforms to get information. But there's been a real shift genera generationally on sort of what is considered media and community media. And to some extent, it's been a larger national conversation first, and then it's sort of been sort of trickling down to that community level. Um, I think what's important to remember is that the view of especially journalists has changed exponentially in the last five, six years. Um, when the term fake news hit the general sort of hive brain, I cringed a lot. Um, but it really shifted how journalists have been treated um, and how media in general has been treated. Um, and so getting back to the roots of information, when I think about community that or community media, that's sort of what I come back to is it's not always about statewide or national issues. It's about community issues. And that's why um, sort of teaching students how to be good storytellers within their communities is the starting place. Um, because if they can be good storytellers, they can start to push out the, you know, the fake news comments or the relevancy comments. Um, and they can find ways to sort of penetrate through different media channels, an audience that will start to listen and trust. Um, and it all it really comes back to where it starts in the community, because if the community is not trusting news and information, then you have nowhere to start. Um, you've got to sort of get them to understand that you're a trustworthy person. And so community media in my brain is, is so important because if you put yourself in a community, your students are storytelling in that community and the community starts to trust, um, they can also start to learn how to filter out what's going on beyond the community. And sometimes it takes a little bit of education uh, on the part of those who have built that trust to show how you can learn what's good to listen to and what's not. Um, so I, I, I think that community media in general is, is pivotal to how we all consume information moving forward. How's that for a start? Yeah. Yeah. Maya, you're, you're sure. nodding your head vigorously, so you, yeah. you, you nominated yourself to follow up. See, yeah, look at that. Well, that's great. Well, I mean, I, I really admire Megan's point about trusts. I think that that is something that um, there's, a, there's a deep mistrust these days. And, and I kind of want to preface all this by saying, like, in no way am I placing any value judgment on different lanes that people take. Mm -hmm. Like, journalism is not over here and community media is some other pure form over here. Like there, there is absolutely interdisciplinary ways that they can inform each other and they glean ideas and documentary filmmaking is not on some pedestal over here mm -hmm. either. So let's make sure that we understand that. And this is kind of what I've learned from being in the classroom with students is like a lot of the time I get checked on the fact that like we need a very diverse ecosystem of information. It's not in one lane. Um, you know, it should be coming from all directions and, and they can all inform each other. So um, I think on top of that, like back to uh, Tim's question about why come here, I think it's part of it is about collaboration, right? And the idea that um, being in a privileged position to be at a university and being able to collaborate with the, with the local community media access station, I think opens up a lot of um, real world experience uh, for the folks. And um, so I think that that would be um, a, the main, one of the main reasons um, that brought me here. And I had something else to say, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there because I don't remember what it was. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's gonna come. <laughs> oh, right, that thing I was yeah. gonna say. I like what you said about the diverse ecosystem that really resonates with uh, what I think about all the time. Um, when Tim said, why, why did I wanna come and be here? Um, I ran into this thing in my sort of media studies universe that a filmmaker actually pointed me at. Um, it's this thing online called The Crash Course by a guy who's, I think he's an economist actually, his name's Chris Martinson. And it's this series of like little micro video lectures. Some of them are only like 10 minutes. Do you know this thing? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it, it, 
it kept getting brought up to the point where I was like, all right, I guess I need to look at this. And I made, I made the mistake of starting it at like 11 o'clock at night. And it's, and they're like potato chips. Like you watch one and then you're like, oh, I'll just watch one more. And I'll just watch one more. And there's like 30 of them. So and by 3 a.m. Yeah, by 3 a.m. I was like, oh, I'd taken this crash course. But one of the things he says in this crash course is that um, we are living in a world that's approaching uh, very hard limits in our life, in our lifetime. Um, uh, and he calls them the three E's. It's uh, energy, economics, and the environment. And he's like, the way we're doing everything in these areas either has to change or we're going to be forced to change it because it's gonna, the way we're doing it is going to collapse. It's going to stop working in our lifetime, right? And he makes a very compelling case for that. And it's, you know, it might sound kind of like doom scrolling and alarming, but I felt like it was really empowering because one of the ways he, one of the things he says is that we tend to look at the future like the next 20 years are going to be sort of like the last 20 years. It's just how we kind of situate ourselves. We say, well, it's going to be like the past, but with new technology. And he makes this really strong case that we're at a point right now where the next 20 years are going to be nothing like the last 20 years. Like we can't even really think that it's going to be the same <gasps> just because of major disruptions in those three areas. What does that have to do with media? Um, I'm at this point where I'm, getting students out of high school and they're pivoting, looking at their lives in the next 20 years, you know? And um, so I feel compelled to address that, to say, what does that mean? Um, and I think it applies to everything, not the least of which is media. Um, how do you maintain a diverse landscape? What does journalism mean now when print journalism and television journalism, you know, if you just look at the numbers of newspapers that don't exist anymore, that means those journalists are not employed there anymore. Uh, that means, and, and it's not like a newspaper print journalist just is going to go online. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. There's been a kind of a cratering of what we had thought of as journalism. Um, and my 18 year old students, it's been their whole life. Like that's news to them. They don't know anything else, you know? So what is, what is, what does the actual landscape look like in the next 20 years? And so that's, you know, what I want to kind of understand by seeing what people are working on. So part of it. <clears throat> For me, is that fascinates me is that we all develop curriculum, and so while we are in the and all of us in this room are in the sort of media world industry, how whatever word you want to put on it, right? We're creators in some way, shape, or form. It's not just about understanding the zoom and focus and, and editing and crossfades. You know, I think some of the things we talked about that I think are important, right? We're talking about historical understanding, regulatory understanding, legal understanding, you know, um, community impact. How, when you think about educating students, how do you work that in? Because they're not taking a history class, they're taking a video production class, they're taking a, maybe journalism class, you can justify, great, we're gonna talk about, you know, broadcast rules and ethics around, you know, FCC, but how do we begin to sort of have this conversation with creators to not just think, zoom and focus, but to think, what am I capturing the lens? Why am I capturing it? You know, I, I laugh every time I, my 20, four-year-old, 22, sorry, 23-year-old daughter tells me about be real on Instagram. And I'm like, well, that also has to get taught in the classroom, <laughs> not just <clears throat> technology. Talk a little, who wants to talk a little bit about sort of maybe, Megan, again, I'm gonna start with you first, because journalism, and you know, you're, you're, you're running a news station mm -hmm. which sometimes has to teach people how to act like a news station, and there are rules or norms that news stations have, but if you don't teach students history about history, right? Maybe you can talk about history. You know, we'll, I'll throw one of the two of the other topics at, at either the other two of you as we go. Yeah, I mean it's tough when you're in a college newsroom in particular because you only have students for two years, so historical context for juniors and seniors is hard to plant um, because. You know, I'm in my 18th year at Linden, which is terrifying, by the way. Um, but I, I have a lot of historical context and knowledge that they do not have. So a lot of times I'm like, but, 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 and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but I, I'm going to go backwards to sort of what sure. you started talking about, which is about curriculum and how you sort of take a curriculum and help sort of feed this a little bit. Um, I, I've gotten a little loosey goosey in my curriculum in the last few years. Um, Obviously, there are foundations that carry no matter what. Everybody has to understand good composition, good audio. Um, 
and they have to understand the basics of editing. Like that's like, duh. Okay. If, if we want to produce good content that people are going to consume, we need to understand some basics. Um, but where I have really started to hone in and, and change the approach is the storytelling component. Um, it's the, it's the who, what, where, when, why let's go back to the five, the five basics. Um, and in a lot of cases, I, I really just put parameters on a course, but what happens within it is different every semester because we're having conversations about what's happening in real time. Mm -hmm. And, and instead of using history as the crutch, um, we're looking at the present and saying, okay, how would you approach this if you were in that position to tell this story? Or, you know, when it comes to legal and ethical things, you know, let's take things from the real populist space and talk about how things are unfolding and how you might approach things differently if you were, you know, the position of running this company that was basically putting themselves over a cliff. Um, so it has become more conversation in real time than historical context. But when it comes to the storytelling, um, you need the historical context. So there's this funny balance. Um, and, and what I have noticed about this next generation of, of consumer of media is they really hate research. Like, just loathe it. Um, if you tell them to go Google things and to do research, they're like, but why? Um, I, I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want it to be right in front of me. It's like this instant, instant gratification generation. Um, and so you have to show them why it's important to do research. And in a lot of cases, um, I make it a game because why not? Uh, if I can make it a speed race of who gets the most information backstory on an information or on a story, then that's engaging and it gets them involved in the process. And it, it sort of makes them understand why that history piece is important. And it makes the storytelling better. Um, because if they're writing vanilla and I want a little meat, then we got to go find the meat. And, and so you got to make it sort of engaging and understanding. Um, and I, I will say that sort of, and it's slightly tangential, but not. I had a fantastic conversation with a retired psychology professor who called, she's teaching one course this semester, and she called and she was, she said to me, Megan, do you understand that nobody watches traditional news anymore? I went, yep. And she was like, they're not even reading the newspaper, Megan. And I said, I know. And she goes, you know where they're getting their information? I went, TikTok. And she goes, yes, TikTok. And she's like, how do they even know what's real? And I said, you have to understand you have to put yourself in that person's shoes. There's some fantastic storytelling on TikTok, if you know where to find it. Um, there's a lot of garbage too. Um, but how do you take the platforms that they're living in and sort of branch off that and engage in them so that students understand the importance of historical context and the importance of <clears throat> storytelling in, in its root format? <clears throat> there's some great people doing some wonderful things in TikTok. Um, and I will tell you that there are some students who still cringe when I say we're jumping into TikTok today. Um, but man, there's relevance. And I think it's important to acknowledge where they are versus where we want them to be. Um, because as commu community media people, um, we don't get better unless we understand the consumer themselves. So that's a very long answer to your very simple question. And I'll shut that's up That's okay. Um, from the sides of that to understand, right, legal, regulatory, mm -hmm. you know, Miles, you, right, part of what's a hallmark of community media is broadcasting town meetings, select board mm -hmm. meetings, public yep. school hearings, which are required by law. Yep. They're mandated public disclosure. Um, I think uh, someone said <coughs> in one of the panels or one of the conversations the last two days that one of the good things, uh, actually I probably shouldn't say that sense, one of the positive effects of the bad of COVID, there's never been a thing about COVID, is um, that more people were able to utilize community media to see their town meetings. They wouldn't, because they physically couldn't go there. Mm -hmm. They normally wouldn't. Now they can actually watch it, streamed as broadcast. Is that an important part of stuff to share with, with in your curriculum that, you know, there are some mandates of things that state, federal, local government mm -hmm. does and, and media can benefit from that? Yeah, I mean, you know, so part of the community media production class is to kind of teach this history of where this came from, right? So, 
you look at the history and I kind of actually touch upon public broadcasting and, mm -hmm. and you even need to contextualize the tools of communication, which were bulky, couldn't move, very exclusive, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you know, most of us probably know the name Lauren Glenn Davidian, who has started uh, CCTV. And if you go back to that history, I mean, that, that is a, a history of activism that took a legislative approach, which was it was like, you know, banging on the door and putting things in place so that there was funding to kind of create these stations. And I think that, you know, um, Lauren Glenn often comes and talks to class and, and basically says, you know, the, the community is one piece of a larger role of activism, but that legislation point in doing that hard work of getting in the weeds there and also collaborating with people that like like to read law. <laughs> like I'm not, I can't read it. Like I'm not I'm not gonna do that work. But if I'm good with a camera and can pair with somebody that can do that work, you know, those collaborations is what kind of starts to push push the needle a little bit. So, you know, I think the other thing that, you know, even even in anthropology, there's a long history of visual anthropology being the kind of the stepchild of colonialism, which was like, oh, darn, this is starting to look a lot like people with privilege going into other areas, documenting and coming out and then continually trying to self-reflect and undo that process and say, how can we do it better? And it's only, you know, being a um, Coming from that background, they said, you know, when's if we put the tools of communication into the people? When's if we train the people? So to kind of draw that through line into COVID, I think the one thing that community media has always done and that Lauren Glenn tends to put a fine point on is the resiliency, which is the need to pivot, the need to figure out how to do hybrid meetings so that city council and local politics can still be transparent. Um, the need to provide when the internet comes out, internet training, cybersecurity, like whatever these advancements, these technological advancements, whatever these were, community media is always responding and kind of like, you know, leading the charge or at least leveling the playing field um, to make things more accessible. So I think, you know, the, the history is really important. And part of that history is how the process, like the process at which this is all engaged and so then how do you teach process? Like you can show, you can do case studies, you can do all this stuff. But I think part of the goal too is to teach people good processes outside of the tech as well. Um, and that kind of hits on what Megan is gonna hint on, like kind of pointed at, and I'm sure, you know, well, Gordon's ready to touch well, on that. <laughs> well, uh, and I'll put it, cause I, I'm saving these parts for each of you with, with intention. So on the, so history, regulatory, legal, Gordon, you know, I, I has, it came from a student who created something and put a logo on it and I went, but you don't have the right to use that logo, right? And now, now we're talking to students who are video production students, and we have to start teaching them about, you know, licensing and rights and reuse and rebroadcast and retransmission because they want to just grab everything and pull it off the internet and cut it into a show and go. I'm like, you can't use a clip of Gilligan's Island because that company that owns that is going to come. You're going to get a cease and desist letter. In the sort of the creative side, how do you challenge students to be creative? maybe you know take advantage of you know some of the federal rules that you can if you're mocking something you can you know retransmit something how have you approached that from the curriculum side right on the sort of teaching students legal when they're not in the class to teach legal they're in the class to learn creative yeah you're not gonna like my answer about this um, all right. because <laughs> that's artists because artists like the whole art angle on that. Like if you if you step outside of broadcast and like art schools are like steal everything. They're just like artists steal. That's what we do. And um, <clears throat> but I do you know I mean that's a flip answer. But I find it's I'm kind of working from the opposite end. I find students are extremely terrified. They've spent their whole life being told don't plagiarize or you will die. Uh, that intellectual property and like intellectual prop the idea of intellectual property, which is just I mean, not to get all Marxist, but it's a capitalist construct so that artists could profit, right? And they just take that as like holy law from down high. Like that, that's the, the thought of, they're, they're, they, the thought that they can borrow and appropriate is news to them. So, and, and to actually, I actually encourage it and try to teach it because it's, it's an important part of art making. Um, and have them say, like, they would be terrified to use a clip from, from Gilligan's Island. And I will say, if you're doing it for student work, you're learning something, it's covered under fair use. Don't worry about it. If you're going to 
try to monetize it or claim that it is yours, that's where the problem comes in. Like, so to get under the skin of like what intellectual property really means and why it exists and how, how does it stand up to the fact that you can Google damn near any image and have that content, you know, it's like, it's, and their ideas about it are really kind of, they're simultaneously terrified that they're going to get sued. Um, but also have access to everything in ways in which that nobody ever has before, you know? And so my thinking of it as like a creative person is to, you know, I don't think it served them to be that terrified of that because it's not, I don't know, you know, it's like, what's more important are you that you're going to get sued by Disney or that you understand like how to be critically media literate, which when you talk about curriculum, um, there's a whole, um, school of that, of creative, uh, not creative, a uh, critical, critical media literacy, like stepping back and understanding, like, what are the systems? Why are things the way they are? Um, do they have to be that way? Have they always been that way? You know, and a lot of that stuff, like ideas about intellectual property, like in the history of art, it's not very long and it's very specific depending on where you are in the world, you know? And I love your answer. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> Steal it. <laughs> that's why I want it, because there's that, there are not hard and fast yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I was very excited to work on when I first got involved in, in the Television Academy, um, um, full disclosure, I'm the current, trust, the current treasurer of the Television Academy, working on Mission New England and the outgoing chair of strategic planning for the Television Academy. The reason why that's relevant is because I was frustrated when we did away with the program called Creating Critical Viewers, where we created programs that the Television Academy could take into schools. We've replaced that with the National Student Television Awards, which is a nice way to engage students to create content and send it for recognition, and it allows them to practice the craft. But we basically traded education off for an award show. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm there, that's why I said I love your answer. Um, I bring that up because you know part of some of how do we create what's I'll say you know the title my pen the slide leadership like critical viewers critical assessment critical you know one of the things sometimes I think we also worry about as educators is like pitting not pitting students against each other but having them I think it's important that students when I have students give visual presentations all the other students in the class have to do an anonymous survey of those presentations. And usually the first question is, did you learn something from this presentation? Because I can tell a student, say, you gotta give a three to five minute PowerPoint presentation, no more than eight slides. And they could do that. And I'm like, what the hell did they just say? Yeah. They didn't follow the rubric. Or So let's talk a little bit about leadership and how do you empower in production classes where sometimes that naturally rises. You see the, you know, the producer, the director, the person that sort of takes control of the group. How do you sort of look then at developing the, the leadership talent, right, of, of in a curriculum? Do you, do you instill things in specific assignments? Do you see how the dynamic of the classroom plays out? It's probably a little of both, and I'm not gonna make you start first. I so appreciate I'm gonna let Gordon start first. Yeah. yeah. Did you have somebody in mind, or can I take that? No, you you were, you were I think you were connected. Yeah, I was thinking myself. about that, yeah. Um, now, now that, what was I gonna say? Um, oh, well, not to echo exactly what I said before, but that the whole critical thing, critical media literacy. Um, I think that what I've come up against with my students a lot, and I'm I'm have a lot of first years right now. Um, in like a, like you were mentioning a three minute PowerPoint, did you learn something? Um, I find it's pretty easy to just target um, two things that I'm like a broken record with students: uh, specifics and substance. Um, They've got, like, I find that my students, and it reminds me of what you're saying about um, not reading newspaper, you know, it's like, they, they, by and large, need to be coached to replace vague language with specifics. Yeah. And they, you know, they're, it's like they've been taught to have a high word count. So they will kind of go on, but not get, say anything, right. you know? So it's just like unlearning, retraining to be like, cut all that fluff and like, it, it, it can be short if it is specific and substantive. It doesn't have to, you don't have to go on at length, just make your point. And it's like what you're saying about apprehensive, being apprehensive to research, you know? It's like their idea, I think their ideas about, you know, um, research and reading, it's like they've been kind of miseducated about work and specifics and substance. And so 
I, I, I kind of feel like I have this uh, Yoda meme where it's Yoda saying like, you must unlearn what you have learned, you know? <laughs> and so I find there's a lot of that where it's like, it's not, it's not take, it's not taking medicine. It's like, this is what you want. You want to get the, what you said, the meat, you want to get the juice. Like, where's the juice here? So, so, so travel the conversation to miles, you know, do you see students grasping that and lead others? Do you have to sort of, you know, motivate groups? You know, do you put it into assignments to sort of have students want to say, all right, I'll be the researcher on this group. You know, um, yeah, you know, again, a quick example, when I give students group assignments and it's someone writes the paper, someone does the presentation, someone does the PowerPoint, <coughs> but they decide, they go, those are the three things, there's three people in your group, you decide who does that best, right? Do you figure out how to sort of build leadership within groups or production groups or in yeah, the classroom? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit nuanced, right? Because I think to kind of Gordon's point and to your point, right? Like this term rubric, like I, I like, <laughs> putting them in a box that has, you know, very direct learning objectives and, and like kind of speaks to them and lets them know what's expected of them. And it's actually a great learning tool. Like pedagogically, people have developed this for a reason because it's clear for students and, and, it, and it serves a purpose. It gives them a small box to swim in, so to speak. I take a little bit more of an individualized approach. And I think the, you know, the biggest concern that students have with me is like, there's no structure. I'm like, but there is structure, but I'm also just like allowing you to be an individual and kind of like <laughs> allowing you to find your own place in it. So again, like, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that the biggest like unlearning that I've had to ask people to do is like, I want you to fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make mistakes, break things, like forget to turn on your audio and then tell us about it. Don't hide it. Like, like, and, and I think it's nor normalizing this behavior that you're, you have to fail fast and um, actually like giving them credit for that. Being like, write about it and I'm going to be more impressed and be more proud of you overcoming these mistakes than I am with you coming in with a very polished product. Now, this is in a very safe contained environment, right? And I understand that, that this is within the parameters of a 15 week semester in a college classroom where I'm the only barrier or like the the sole evaluator but a lot of the time i say i'm not even evaluating your work i'm just giving you credit to get it done and my whole role is to provide feedback and allow you to do an iterative process so like i, I think to just kind of drive home on that is you know finding what students are, like are pulled towards like some students naturally go into a leadership position but then also creating environments that allow the students that maybe are not feeling as compelled uh, to go into that leadership position, trying to get them there too, um, which does take some facilitation. So it's, I'm not like hands off. And I think that there's like a lot of times where, um, you know, you do a camera tutorial and there's a few cameras on the table and the people that know how to use the cameras are normally the first ones to put their hands on them. So how do you make sure that you get space to get other folks in there. And there is like, there's just like a baseline of like good tech, like it is true. If something's out of focus, it's out of focus. If something sounds bad, it sounds bad. Like, like there is like, there is a level at which, you know, you need, they need to understand uh, also like the, the potential trend, the potential expectations of what it means to tell somebody's story. And if you do that a disservice technically, are you doing that person a disservice? And so now we're getting into ethics. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll pause there. And, and but you talked a little bit about what's the craft, you know, and yeah. so Megan, you're mixing the craft, right? And, yeah. and we, the television academy, Megan's also on the, the television academy board as well. Um, uh, last of the, the last of the trustees, yep. as we refer to them, our long story. So the current trustee, um, and we have craft categories, yep. yet that changes in the dynamic of a newsroom where there 100%. has to be a hierarchical system. So how do you teach leadership, taking, you know, good advice and bad advice, you know, when someone is in charge of a newscast and they're telling other students <laughs> and the, that other students go, wait a second, you're the same age as me and I might even be older than you and who are you to tell? How do you teach that yeah. and have students be open to that if they do want to end up within a news organization, they're going to have to be ready, willing, and able to deal with that. Sure. Um, 
I'm going to say this first thing and then I'm going to tell you that I completely broke the rule. Um, our curriculum at Linden is stair steps. So, um, so there's at least three semesters of sitting in this newsroom and you kind of start at the bottom and you work your way up. Um, and the reason we do it that way is because obviously, you know, somebody new to that environment, you don't expect them to rise to the top, but they also need to get the lay of the land and just getting leadership skills to like approach somebody they don't know to get a story is a complicated feat. Um, and so starting them at base level of like, my expectation is this, just produce a story on your shift, please day turn it. Um, and multiple platforms, broadcast and web, let's do that. Let's start there. Um, so that when we start to sort of bring them up the ranks to the point where in their final semesters, they're directing and producing, there's not only an understanding for the first person who's in the door new, who might be scared out of their mind, um, so that you can sort of go, I've been there, uh, understand that, let's sort of work with each other to make it better. Um, but I will say this, and I, this is where I flipped the script, the script a little bit. Um, we have two first year students, first years, they should not be touching the newsroom, um, that came to me with drive that I have never seen before, um, one of whom was involved at Northwest Community Access, um, who quite frankly, um, I needed to harness the energy because if I have a student who's showing leadership qualities, I don't want to belittle it. I want to sort of make it grow. I want to plant it and grow it. Um, and so I, I dangled a carrot and I put it in a course that they're currently in. And I said, hey, do you want to come direct New 7? Do you want to sort of see what that's like? Do you want to do some pre-production work? Do you want to sort of understand what's going on behind the scenes? And there was like, there's not even a pause, it was a yes. And I went, okay, great. So now I have first year students who are driven, who quite frankly, look at the seniors and go, you're not cutting it. Uh, and have no problem doing that um, and are respected because they have stepped into roles that normally they would not touch. Um, but what has happened is it's it's all a matter of, yes, there's the stair step and there's a deliberate reason for a stair step. Um, but what I have sort of resigned myself to understanding is that there are some students who quite frankly exhibit those leadership skills right out of the gate. Um, and who are confident enough. And so if you can put them in a position to counteract those who may not be rising to the challenge, um, perhaps it's an opportunity to show those who should be in better leadership roles um, how they should be running their newsroom um, and how they should be treating their peers. Um, and so, yes, I flipped the script. No, I'm not bad about, mad about it. Um, but I will tell you that it has changed the dynamic of, at least in a four-year program, how someone looks at a first year student. And it has changed the conversation to, okay, I need to really pony up and show what I'm made of because I now have a first year student who's kicking my behind um, and telling me that what I'm producing is not good enough uh, and they're right. So I think, you know, you gotta, there's a balance. Well, yeah, leadership shows itself. <laughs> yeah, as it does. Um, so, one phrase that I love to take and repurpose, which is all politics is local. In my opinion, all news is local. You know, how do you all with the, you know, current state of sound by city national news tied with the maybe a little bit of, if I, I'll say stuff that people don't like as well, the echo chamber of social media when young people are on it, they're in it and it's a whole group of friends and it's just this little, you know, Everybody thinks they're hot when they post their hot photo. How do you get in between the two of that and sort of explain to them that local information, local content, local news, hyper local is, is what people are interested in. What's happening in my area, what's happening in my neighborhood. I can't really change what's happening on the other side of the country or you know, in DC or in you know in the Goss Strip. I but I can only change what's, you know. I can only go outside and figure out what's, how I can help the homeless that are in Battery Park. How do you sort of teach to understand that local is really where it starts and understanding your community 
and then you can engage, communicate to, and impact that community. You know, how do you sort of teach that part of the curriculum when sometimes students think, I'm gonna to go to college and I'm gonna learn about the world. And actually, you should be learning about your backyard. Your, sorry, Miles, yeah, you want I can, to start? I can go ahead. Um, you know, I think the good thing about teaching project-based classes is that you know, they have the choice to go out in the community and, and learn. And I think, you know, going back to history, there's, there's a ton of modeling for this. Like, I think a great example here in Burlington is I get to show a film called The Photo Lounge Chronicles, which is about Dan Higgins, who is a local photographer. And Dan was teaching at the University of Vermont for a long time and would require students that after they would need to pick a place, whether it's a dorm room or a, a local grocer or whatever it is, the requirement was that they need to go back and exhibit the photos in the place that they were taking. So it's actually built into the curriculum in the project description that, that the, the, the design of the class needs to do it. I do it by hosting a community screening. So if anyone engages with a local community partner that they can bring um, those folks onto campus and screen the film for them. So, uh, there's certainly ways in which it, it can kind of like it can be built into the the you know the being it having it be project based there's there's a lot of like modeling for it I think the other thing too is like building social capital about why the local is cool is kind of like something that folks are getting getting interested in and, and with the students in community media production this year I think to be honest like for them to go back and so one of the exercises is like go find something in the archive go search cctv.org find something in the archive that you like and then reflect on it and talk about you know what you're getting from it and upon doing that inevitably everyone's like I love the this they don't use the word aesthetics but they're I love that it looked like a home movie or I love seeing Burlington in 1980 or 1990 and so they start to kind of um, uh, there's like this nostalgia that starts to kind of come into play and then I think that paired with good examples can kind of like really excite um, folks to want to um, you know uh, approach this work so yeah Gordon you, you see that with sort of you know, to look at looking at local artists, looking at local. You you referenced that before. Um, you know, do students do you help them think about learning from the local to help them expand their vision nas nationally or internationally? Yeah, and um, listening to this makes me think about like <clears throat> rather than what uh, kind of ser serve them, like gather resources and present it to them. There's that. But then also not presuming <clears throat> what they do or don't know. Yeah. So like, uh, I don't have to remind myself, but I like build into my practice that there's a certain starting there, like taking the temperature. I don't want to presume like that they don't read the newspaper or like that they don't know anything about what's going on locally because I'm often completely wrong or I want to be wrong. Like if I assume like you guys don't really know what's going on in Burlington, do you? And, and sometimes I don't. And then I'm like, well, you know, what do you like where are you coming from like what is what matters to you what's important to you right rather than me saying well you should know what's going on locally like kind of coming in back like backing into it and being like what drives you yeah well, what's what's important to you like this year like does it matter to you that you don't feel safe going to this place or like are you aware that this is happening kind of root it in their own experience so that it matters to them and it's not like what do you want me to do um, like, and it's, it reminds me of like what you were saying about we understand the structures of like how to how to motivate people with rubrics and say like here's what I want you to do and I find that students are very well educated in that so much so that again with the unlearning like when I don't tell them exactly what to do when I say what do you want to do what's important to you they're just like well, lots of times well that's where the leaders come in right those are people are like I know exactly what I want to do get out of my way and then other people are like will you please tell me what to do yep. and they can't it's difficult. I don't want to say they can't stand it. It's difficult for them because they don't. No one's ever let them do that, you know. Where where they're like, well, just please tell me what you want. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I it's, it's it's different for me because the the new seven serves fourteen communities. It does not serve our campus, um, and I won't let them cover campus news unless there is a reason it connects to the fourteen towns in which they serve. Um, and so I force the issue. I force them to get to know their communities. I force them to get to know the players in those communities. I force them to build relationships with major players, town managers, you know, select board folks, school board folks. I, I force it because at least in the kingdom, you know, there's, there has to be a murder for 
Burlington to pay attention to that region. Um, and so it's sort of saying to them, look, you are it. You are the way other than the local paper, how people are going to know about what's going on in the community. And if you don't sort of harness that and, and respect it, because you're serving the people of these 14 towns, this isn't the place for you. Like, this is our job. Um, and we make it a job. The newsroom, the way it's set up is not, yes, it's a class, um, but it's running like a news organization and that is their job. And, and if we treat it like that, they tend to respect it a little bit more. Um, and they also, because they're interacting with the community every day, are told how important it is that they're out and about doing what they're doing. And so uh, it doesn't take me to reinforce it. The community is doing that for me, um, which I really appreciate. Um, and when they miss something, the community has no problem telling them they miss something. And I really appreciate that. Um, so it's, uh, it's a two way street. And in a lot of ways, um, the community is coming to us and saying, can you please make sure that they know that we're doing X, Y, and Z. Uh, and so we've created this relationship that's sort of symbiotic. Um, that just sort of naturally falls into place. But don't don't get me wrong, the students who come to me know what they're in for. And and they they actually that is part of the drive for them being at Linden is that it's real time, real community, real people, right. not make believe. So So you talked a little bit about sort of, you know, the community will tell them and maybe I'll I'll start with even Miles recording, you know, Part of one of the things I also think is important as much as people talk about integrity or journalistic integrity. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about how do you teach or not teach? How do you educate students on the concept of ethics and do you challenge them to do their own ethical decision making when making a story, when creating a creative product, you know, that is going to motivate someone to do something. As I, you know, sometimes I say to students like, you know, you want a reaction from someone when you make a film. Laugh, cry, fear, <coughs> you know, you sit in your chair for seven minutes after the film ends because you're just a little bit about what you saw, but you've created an emotion. When somebody goes, oh, that was okay, nothing's happened. When you start talking about community media, when you start talking about journalism, you start talking about creative messaging to instill change, ethics comes into play in a big way. How do you tie that into, because you can't, you can teach it, but do you want to teach it? Maybe, you know, I'm going to start with you, Gordon. Sometimes you talked about, you, there seems to be a reoccurring theme with your classes, like, I'm going to let them make mistakes, and then maybe that's where the learning comes in. Right. Talk a little bit about ethics and that world. Yeah, that's a place where you don't, it kind of runs counter to my instincts, which is what you were talking about, like, fail up, you know, like, go ahead and make mistakes. Um, you don't want to make ethical mistakes. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's not the best way to learn that. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is, but it can be painful or dangerous, which we don't advocate or you know want to steer them into harm's way. So, boy, um, I just said, you know, don't want to steer them into harm's way. And when you were talking earlier, I was thinking about, like, ultimately, because there's so many different ways students can come up against an ethical problem, whether it's aesthetically or journalistically. Um, I think just kind of putting the baseline of do no harm in there, yeah. you know, cause that can take many forms. Um, and there's, you know, whether or not it's l legal or ethical, ultimately it's like, are you going to hurt somebody here? And uh, it you know, unintentionally perhaps or yourself. Right. Um, so I don't know maybe that's, maybe that's cutting below, you know, the, an ethical classroom or a legal thing, but, um, that's kind of where I land with that. Um, while simultaneously trying to say that, like things are safe and reassure them that like you know maybe boundaries need to be pushed or you know are you timid about being transgressive when like in this situation that's where the, the interesting thing is going to happen if you transgress you know journalistically or artistically can you do that without doing harm yeah. you know so it's it's a tightrope dance and um, when you're saying about it's a, like a safe place to make mistakes um, I like almost weekly or every, you know, sometimes every class I'm like, um, we all like the, the cliche of learning from your mistakes is, you know, we all say, we all know, like 
we learn from our mistakes, but nobody gets up and is like, today's mistake day. <laughs> like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do nothing right today. I'm going to do everything wrong, you know? And I'm like, it, what you were saying really resonated with me because I'm like, look, it's, it's okay to do it wrong. Or students would say, I'm really bad at blank. You know, I'm really bad at screenwriting. And I'm like, I've learned to answer, do it badly. Yeah. You know, just be okay, good to know, do it badly. That's why you're here. And then we'll fix it, you know, do it wrong. Miles, how do you, how do you take ethics into yeah. fit, learn to fit, learn by failing, but how do you guys, Jordan makes a good point, yeah. ethically you can be literally physically dangerous. Yeah, yeah it, gets, it gets really sticky very fast. Like for instance, I had a student, um, you know, Partly because everything culminates in a, in a community screening, which is, you know, so I put time restrictions on their on their projects. They should be less than five minutes. A lot of people show up with things that are 10 minutes long. And then, <laughs> you know, for an ethical example, for instance, like a student went um, and documented, uh, did some long form interviews with uh, an organization called AALV, which is the Associations of Africans Living in Vermont. And so they work with folks in the new American space and they went there and they conducted these interviews and came back with a 10 minute video, which kind of like the point of the video was to give these folks some airtime, so to speak. And the, the ethics became like it was the audio was so bad you couldn't really hear it. It was long form. We played it in class. Students are kind of tuning out. And so it's like, OK, like what happened there? And so like this is a really interesting case study of holy smokes, like the social change of this was to give these people 10 minutes of airtime, which really is not that much time. But then the problem was that it didn't execute well. So like, what happens then? You didn't do right by them. Yeah, so, so teaching, so it, it's, you know, you, you have to manage that a little bit. And, and there's, there's this framework that kind of came out of, of, um, of what's been happening in the documentary world, specifically as documentaries become commercially viable and there's a lot of pressures from large studios to, buy up these documentaries, push deadlines, push story beats, the ethics of true crime, like it is just wildly messy right now. And there's uh, something called the Documentary Accountability Working Group, D-A-W-G, um, which lay out a framework around like really good practices and ways to kind of check, your check yourselves and methodologies. And, you know, I think what Community Meter offers is, is basically like a, um, a, a real ground level and transparency around the fact that they're there to serve the community, right? Like it's pretty well established. And so one of the things that uh, sometimes I focus on to kind of undercut it all and, and to not put value judgment on like some students that's so interested in production and can make like a wicked flashy, super slick piece um, is gonna really make another student in the class feel really bad about the fact that they have no production skills. So how do you manage these different levels? And one thing I say, and this actually comes from a movie called Come On, Come On, which is a Mike Mills film. It's a fictional film. Joaquin Phoenix plays an NPR reporter. And kind of, spoiler alert, but like the point of it is as an NPR reporter, he's questioning why, why it's important to go interview people. And I think all the time, sometimes we're like, oh, this is extractive, or we, we kind of like worry about the bad things that it does. But the point of that movie and what I've really tell my students is like, Actually, maybe the most, and don't want to maybe use the word empowering, but maybe one of the most meaningful things that you can do and maybe the most social change you may enact is to go up to somebody and say, your story matters enough for me to put a microphone and record it. So baseline, everyone has the ability to make some change just by saying you're important enough to be recorded. And so I think community media does this, which is like, come into our studio and talk. We will archive you. Um, your, your words are important and are meaningful and are worthy enough to be recorded. So I think that that's kind of a, 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 a that's where I've found a baseline to be able to say like, you wanna just interview your roommates because you're so scared to go out. Like maybe that's the way that you can enact social change or things like that, so. Megan, you have more in the news business, there are more hard and fast rules, mm -hmm. right? There's standards and practices that networks have. Yep. There's you know journalistic societies that have sort of rules and standards. Sure. There's newsroom policies. You know, how do you sort of teach people to sort of be creative and be, you know, journalistic, knowing that there are then some, you know, they little training lanes or in the bowling alley. Right? <laughs> it all comes back to the storytelling, right? It, the who's impacted by the story that you're trying to tell and how do we tell that story creatively in a way that's engaging so that everybody wants to be part. And I will say that like, if you, if you have been living in a cave, there have been a lot of uh, ethical 
moments in Vermont State College history in the last, I don't know, six months. Um, so it has been a real think tank of uh, journalistic ethical standards when uh, we're working with student journalists whose roof is the story um, and sort of balancing how they do that with uh, making sure that all voices of that story are told and that they're not going to be put under a microscope um, in a way that sort of challenges that journalistic integrity by those above me. Um, and it's sometimes just a matter of like putting that to the side and just saying, who's impacted by what the story is here and who should we be talking to and go get that. It, like we'll worry about the ethics part when you talk to the people who are impacted. And then it's a matter of threading that story together in a way that doesn't show bias and doesn't sort of cross that ethical line. Um, I, I feel like I should be thanking the Board of Trustees for giving me such fodder um, for this last semester. But um, it definitely has created a lot of conversation um, about when you become the news um, and how you do that in, in a sort of tricky balancing act kind of way. Um, so yeah, as I said, I should be thanking them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do a lot in public relations work. So for sure, PR is do not become the story. Um, yeah. So I want to make sure we leave some time for questions. Look at that. Are you putting a hand up for a question? No, yeah. we're just scratching. You know, I'm, I'm, I do. I love it. Go right away. Yeah, I want to make sure we get some. Yeah, I just, want just to tell everybody who you are, okay. so, we, so we know where you're coming from. I'm Carlos uh, Grinstead. I work over in Gene Etsy, which is Southern Vermont. Um, I'm a content producer and uh, communication person, and I run their education programs there. Uh, but I had a question uh, about the journalism yeah. aspect of it, uh, especially in regards to local journalism sure. and the integrity of that. Um, I I want to get more into producing content for that and teaching how to do that to to the people that come into their station and to the kids that I'm um, educating. I, I get frozen though, uh, and there's a couple things that freeze, because I love stories, I love telling stories, that's my favorite thing. But uh, when it comes to reality, it becomes very scary to me, and I think it's because it feels a little bit, especially on the local level, like I'm spreading gossip. Mm -hmm. and, and there's there's that sort of um, fear about, uh, am I, why am I telling this story? Do, do people actually need to know this information? And is this information just gonna cause more problems sure. um, down the line? And then, um, yeah, and uh, so I just had a question about that. I guess I had more, but It's okay, full disclosure, I actually did all of my graduate work at GNAT oh. um, and ran part of their educational programming for a while. Right. Um, so uh, there you go, there's part of my resume you probably didn't know existed. <laughs> um, I, I will say this. Um, Journalism is a public service. And our job, and to some extent, it's sort of coupled with what community television is all about, is to hold people accountable for what's going on in communities. It's, it's how we're holding our public, our elected public officials accountable for the things that they should be doing and, and making sure that our community knows about. Um, but it's also statewide. Um, and so I understand the cringe factor that you're dealing with, but I think it comes down to instead of sort of holding yourself back from it, saying, is this something that the community needs to know, may need clarification on, um, or maybe they don't understand all sides of it, and just find the people who can clearly articulate what's going on and use them as the base. Um, ultimately, you could leverage them to get other stories around whatever it is that you're talking about. But the first step to sort of getting over it is to dive in head first. I mean that in the nicest way. Um, you're not spreading gossip, though in that community, I can see how you might feel that way. Um, because I know that community well enough to know how it rolls. I think you have to start it. You have to push it. You have to um, get a small number of people to get behind putting the truth out there that serves the public that may not be hearing things in all the possible ways they could be. Um, and that, if anything, is what gives you, it's truth to power, right? It's it's the community access part of what you're trying to do actually may shed light on things people don't know about. And so instead of being nervous about it, put it all out there and see how people react to it instead. Because for all you know, they're not getting all the information and you are the ticket to getting the pieces they don't know about. Um, so. 
So you're sort of like the gatekeeper. Which is a scary thing in itself. Yeah. I'm the curator of knowledge, which feels like too big of a responsibility. It's a good responsibility. Yeah. Embrace it. It is. It is. It's important <laughs> that you take people in that, in any media outlet, take responsibility to, to spread information. Yeah. Um, good. Miles, anything to add to that? No requirement. Just feel free. We just need to do the curator of knowledge. If that's if that's anxiety producing, producing, just think. Well, it's not all. Of it. It's not all the knowledge. It's just part of it. So you know, you're a contributor. Yeah. You know, there you go. <laughs> so you only, have, you only need a little bit. You've got a lot. <laughs> uh, other miles? Anything? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a second question. Uh oh. Uh, now, do you guys mind if I take another question? Um, Does anyone have questions yet? Or you're first in line then. <laughs> Uh, collaboration, when you guys are talking about leadership and finding natural leaders and stuff, um, I'm, I'm asking for my students, but I'm also asking for myself because I don't work well with others. How do you encourage collaboration? <laughs> Miles, wait, hold up. So it's going to be Miles and Gordon, you're going to go last. Oh, that's Miles, why. literally out loud. I was loud. Like, yeah. I've heard him chuckling from here, so you can go first. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to self reflect a moment, right? <laughs> I was. I don't want to say I was a terrible collaborator, but I certainly um, thought I knew it all. And I think that there's just like a sign of maturity that comes with being able to take feedback and, and also just negotiating. Like, I think that that's what you have to boil it down to. And then the big thing that I do is I get away from right and wrong and I start to boil it down to like, these are just different tastes. Like somebody's gonna be like, your framing's wrong. It's like, well, the framing may or may not technically be wrong, depends on what you're like where the direction's coming from and, and, and if there is a leader that wants it a certain way and you don't believe that and you're the camera operator, like where's the negotiation? Like, you know, and I think people mule in to kind of find their role. So either pre-establishing that, but, but I think it, it has lightened the disagreement to start to say, okay, let's like really boil this down to if two people are in a space and there needs to be negotiation that it comes down to taste and style. And I think that that, helps alleviate some of the things when it comes creatively. Um, but then um, I think, you know, putting people, if you've been a camera operator that's dealt with a really crummy director, I think that that's a really good way that when you're directing, you won't, cheat, you won't have your camera operator treat your camera operator crummy. And so making sure people kind of, and, and this is why people work their way up the ranks is because hopefully they don't forget what it's like to have been on the bottom rung. So I think sometimes those processes and then getting rotations and getting everyone through rotation is a good way to kind of like uh, create some empathy. Gordon, add to that? Um, yeah, your question is about collaboration and you were talking about the idea of like identifying <laughs> leaders came up. And um, when you were talking about leaders, uh, I was like, well, lots of times students, it's not their strong suit. Like they're, what they're really good at is contributing. And they're not they don't want to be a leader and and so like you need contributors like not everybody can be a leader um so just the idea about collaboration i actually teach it because i find like <clears throat> i want students to collaborate i want them to value collaboration and what i find is that i have to approach it i don't have to but i approach it in a way that unpacks it because again i find that the best intentions of students coming to me they've been kind of miseducated about group work like i start off by saying like what goes through your mind when i say we're going to like, let's form groups, let's do a group project. And like, you know, everybody's gonna roll their eyes. And then I say, okay, well, why are you roll? What's, what are you expecting now? You know, like, you've done this a lot of times. And so I unpack, like, you're anxious that you're gonna do all the work and other people are gonna get credit or your contributions won't be valued, right? Like, there's all kinds of, group dynamics is a thing that people study and teach, right? So I kind of unpack that and say like, okay. And then I also, tr I, I kind of do a tricky exercise where I have them do, uh, a group project that they don't know is a, like an exercise in class that I don't say this is a group thing, but it is. And they do it and they have fun. And then I say, what do you, what did you notice about that? What happened? You know? And I'm like, haha, you just did a group thing <laughs> and, and nobody complained. And I'm like, well, you know, what are the things that make you not want to do group work? You know, it's like <clears throat> the grade, you know, it's like, well, we're going to be unfairly graded. You know, it's like, I'm not going to get an A because there's slackers in my group, right? So there's like all these things built into it that, that make people go, no, no group work. But then when I do a project with them where they get a really fun result, and, I'm, and then I say, that thing you just made, none of you would have made it individually. Like the only reason that exists is because you all work together. And then they're like, oh, 
you know? And I say, I say like, so seek that out, you know? Like, and then the other thing is they all come to me with like, you know, you get into film because you, because of films you love, or you get into game design because, you know, of, you're, you're kind of drawn to it by the things you like. And I'm like, you know, school is telling you that you need to do everything yourself and you need to, it's all DIY and you're where the buck stops. I'm like, all those things you love that brought you here, films, books, television, they're all collaborative. I'm like even things you don't think are collaborative. I'm like, you think Beyonce is a superstar? She's got a team. Like she can't do that herself. She has a publicist and a, you know, a staff. And I'm like, everything is collaborative. So just stop thinking that you have to do it all yourself. And then easier said than done. Like, how can I facilitate practicing that in a way that maybe like removes the stakes a little bit or like takes takes the boot off their neck about like, am I going to get an A? Like, you know, maybe go into that a little bit with within yeah. production, not just for news, but for great production, there's actually teams put together. You know, yeah, I was going to say. want to shoot. It's a camera person and a sound person, <laughs> and a police coordinator, and a producer, and a truck cop. Media is a team sport. Um, it doesn't even matter what part of media you want to be a part of. It is a team sport and you will always work with people who drive you crazy and you will always work, you know, you'll find those gems of people who make you better. Um, it's a matter of putting yourselves in those situations and understanding how to work with both of those extremes. And in, in a, in a media environment, like I, I am constantly saying that from semester one on with my students like I you're going to work with people who pull their weight and you're going to work with people who don't um but I also provide opportunity for them to let it out um so that at the end of a project it's a tell me what everybody did tell me how you all fared from your perspective um so that I understand what worked what didn't where people pulled their weight where they didn't and I sort of just I let it sort of be an avenue for them to let it out so that I have an understanding and everyone on the team is doing the same thing and they all know it, um, which ultimately ends up making them work better because they know that there's an opportunity to tell me how it really happened. Um, but there's also a, if something really went south, reassuring the students who did pull their weight and pull it off that that one team member who did not contribute at all is not going to be a factor in how I look at their work, that collective body of work, and that I take that situation into account when I look at the whole. Um, and so it's, the rubric may, may change a little bit, right? But I think creating reason to enforce the, this is a team sport. Um, and sometimes you just have to be able to manage different personalities and different perspectives. But if you can harness what people are really strong at, um, and collectively as a as a group discuss where strengths and weaknesses are, it always ends up being better. Um, and so providing that opportunity for people just to lay it on the table and say, you know, I really am horrible at editing and I really shouldn't touch that. Um, but I have no problem lining up a whole bunch of interviews and, and being that community outreach person. That's where my strength is. Um, it's allowing those conversations to happen. Yeah, and I'll just touch on Flatters for a little bit because it comes for me. It came early on, um, and it's a, it's a it's a good story. So it's a quick story. So uh, six months out of University of Maryland, the radio television film student. I want to, I don't know. I get a PA job at a commercial, and my job at the end of the shoot is I'm loading scaffolding into the van at two o'clock in the morning, and the producer comes over, starts helping me loading scaffolding, and I go, oh, I got this, Jeremy. I don't know his name, Jeremy Smith. Still know him. Don't know him where he is. So so vivid. This is not my job. He goes. I'm the producer. Every job is my job. Here's my, as we, as he helps me load scaffolding for the next half hour, he gave me the, one of the best training I did not get in college. He said, every job as a producer is your job. Here's what you want to be a good producer. Here's what you need to do. Learn how to be a cameraman. You'll figure out, are you a good cameraman? Who's a good camera person? Who's a bad camera person? How do they get paid well? How do you, how to pay somebody, you know, based on their skill set? Learn every job. Who does it well? Who doesn't do it well? You know how to assemble a team. You then know how to build a collaborative team because you know how to make the skill sets work. And I think that's an important part about collaboration is, is letting people sort of, what are they good at and can they excel at that? And can you team those folks together so they're all having fun, they're all feeling really 
powerful about what role they're taking, and they're doing it collaboratively with other folks. And at the end, you're going to hopefully going to have a good product because they've enjoyed the experience. So that's a little bit, you know, that's really come to my world. Uh, we got ten minutes. Few, we got ten, twelve minutes. Do you have a question, sir? Where are you from? Um, I'm Kurt, the executive director of Millbury Community Television. Um, I'm a former middle school and high school teacher and taught video production at Green Mountain College till they close. Um, as college level uh, educators, what is your take on best experiences and the best practices for younger kids? Sort of signaling out that you, know, you had two first year students who were a notch above. What, what was it that, that sort of developed those kind of students for you before you got them? Makes natural sense. You start. Yeah, I mean, so one of those students approached me during her interview process and said, "I want to be an editor for CNN." <laughs> and I was like, "Rock on! You want to be an editor for CNN?" Um, and I am of the mindset that when someone comes to you that directly, um, you just sort of go, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get you there. That's fine. Um, we may change your viewpoints on what you want to do by the end of it, but that's what you want to do now. And that's fine." Um, I have worked with students who come with a lot of experience from high school, whether it be a tech center or a, a regular sort of high school video program. Um, and I have worked with some who come from none of that. Um, and there's pros and cons to both. Um, in a lot of cases, this, the students who are coming from programs, I have to unprogram them because they have un, they have really bad habits. And so I've got to strip them back to basics and not bore them to death, but get them at least back up to speed. Um, where the student who comes with nothing sometimes is a little bit easier out of the gate. Um, it's all about harnessing the passion and, and the, the drive and providing opportunities to sort of, even outside the classroom, engage them. Um, and it, whether it be in, in one case with one of these students, connecting them with a local access channel so they can continue to do this kind of work outside of the classroom. Um, my job is not just to teach, it's to provide connections and pathways um, and to network, to help them network because they don't know the span of people in which they can touch. Um, there are good programs and bad. The ones that I've seen be really successful at the high school level are the ones that allow with some sort of like boundaries as far as like, this is what we're producing what you produce within it is totally up to you. Um, they're allowing for that creativity to blossom and to not put such strict confines on sort of how we get there. Um, the students come with more passion and drive to want to explore and learn. And those are the students who I find are more successful. The ones who are, here's the project, this is how we're executing it don't tend, they, they lose that creative spark. And so by the time they hit the collegiate level, it's harder to pull that back out of them because they've been so programmed to just do projects based on very tight boxes. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a matter of obviously having overarching goals or objectives in the end, but allowing for that spark to happen that makes one student different from the other. Either of you want to respond to that or just? No, it's just Yep. Hi, Ashley from Boston Network. Um, so my interaction with students is normally like through internships at my station. Um, and I'm a studio manager, so my time with them is very limited on a monthly basis. And what I've noticed more and more is that we have a, a lot of local schools, like have kids do internships there, but more and more they're like, not like go getters, I don't want to call them go getters. Yeah. They just, they're in that shell where it's like they've always been taught how to do, like what to do, not how to do something. Oh. And so it's hard for me to try and instill that in them, even though like I've been doing this for a long time. And I'm wondering like, what is the, I don't want to say quick, easy, but like what is a good way or an efficient way to, to break them of this habit that I have to tell them what they need to do instead of me saying, here is your general direction, this is what you like. This is what you can produce if you feel like doing it, and like go for it. If they want to bounce ideas off me, that's cool too. Like, how do I phrase that to them or get that through their head? That like, you have to take charge in this because I can only take you so far. Because there's no right or wrong way to make community media. 
Right. So I, I, hopefully we'll get time for all of you can answer. Yeah. Miles, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think even just going back to the, the last answer, two things is just, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of times I just really explain the, what this work is mostly is just problem solving. And I, I have learned or I think that modeling is one of the best things. And so if you're like, hey, look, I have an idea, I'm just gonna go do it and you're just gonna shadow me. And sometimes I get super skittish that like, oh, nobody just wants to watch me do it. But then I get feedback where they were like, that was the most informative thing was just to watch you go through the motions. And so maybe taking them out and then like just normalizing the behavior and letting them see, you know, what it's like to just walk up to somebody or how to kind of generate an idea. And then they'll watch you problem solve too. And I think that that would boost some confidence. Gordon, you want to um, I agree, modeling. And then <clears throat> as much as possible, I think it reminds me of what I was saying before about there's a fear factor yeah. where students are so apprehensive about doing it wrong. Yeah. And it, like, if it's just like, you know, sometimes that's really true if it's a, like a safety issue or something or quality control. But, um, you know, if, if you can kind of find that valve of like, is it, are they needlessly fearful, like just out of habit? You know, like, yeah. I want you to tell me exactly what to do so that I don't do it wrong. Like, if you, that's probably just making really clear expectations about like, you're not going to hurt anybody or, you know, um, if it's not a safety thing, if they're just kind of skittish because they're fearful of disapproval, you know. Yeah. It could be that they're overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think there's, when we're in this environment, just as working professionals, we sometimes forget that the environments we're in are very complicated and very overwhelming. Um, and there are a lot of moving parts. And so it is quite possible that they don't know how to be creative because they're overwhelmed and don't even know where to start. And so stripping it back to basics, um, finding out what it is that has them interested in this particular media industry, and then harnessing that one little bit to show them a small piece of a whole, um, whether it be a shadowing, whether it be um, giving an opportunity to do something that is special to them. Um, finding ways to sort of break down that barrier of uncomfortability and making it an environment that they know they can they can fail in, but they can be comfortable in, um, so that it becomes you're turning the uncomfortable feeling into the hey, I kind of want to be here and do all this stuff. Um, I, I just, I sometimes think, especially with high school students, they don't, um, vocalize the uncomfortable part, if at all, <laughs> very well. I think also just verbal affirmation sometimes of like, you did a great job right there. And then they're like kind of hooked, <laughs> you know, like you're allowed to tell them they're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> Even when it's like, it could be something really simple. Other question? Come Yeah, the curiosity factor is a lot different. Um, higher or lower? It's higher. Um, I will say sometimes, I, I've only worked with a handful of, of homeschool students, but um, the collegiate environment is very overwhelming for homeschool students. So when you can narrow the overwhelming down to like, let's just do this <laughs> in the moment, they tend to do better. Um, but sometimes they take too much on at once because they're so curious, they almost like overwhelm themselves with all these things they want to do. And so it's a matter of showing them how to parse out that creativity and, and make it a lot easier to attain. Um, there, it's more than homeschool students who have that issue, but I've noticed it more with them. Um, but I will say that sometimes that perspective is one that adds to a conversation collectively as a whole. Um, that perspective of not having gone through the traditional way of doing things. Um, and it forces a conversation about this, depending on the story, like who really is impacted by something um, because perspectives are different. It's, a, it's an, it's, and it's because it's a growing trend, Jordan Miles, you know, homeschooling, you see a difference mm -hmm. and how do you help that difference in students that are homeschooled versus traditional school? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have any specific examples, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit pause. Um, this, this is kind of related. Um, 
I'm still have to remind myself that, oh, by the way, we just went through two years of lockdown where everybody was not homeschooled, but everybody was at home. Yeah. So I'm still dealing with the fallout of that, frankly. Like sometimes I, I, I get done with a class, I'm like, what is going on? And I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> They've been, they were, in a, they were in their bedroom for two years. Do you know what I'm saying? And like, that's not going anywhere for a while. Like, that, it's been a, let's not forget that we just, I had a colleague who made a speech coming back that said, the, <clears throat> he used the term antediluvian, which is like, means after the flood, you know? And he's like, let's just not forget, we've been through, like we we're underwater for two years. So like, it's, things aren't gonna dry out for a while. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this with one last question, which is a uh, <clears throat> single sentence answer for each of you. <clears throat> what is the favorite class you teach and not to tell anybody why, everybody's gonna go look at your CV at your university or your, your, here's what I teach. What's your favorite class you teach, Megan? Mobile storytelling. Mobile storytelling. Miles? Uh, I'm actually gonna do something different. I'm gonna point out two of my favorite students right here that I've worked with in the past, Jordan Mitchell and Danny right there, both working at CCTV, and they have taken um, community media production. So I'll say community media production. Gordon? Uh, what I did this morning, making media activism. So do you have a prop? You had a prop. You said you had a prop. Um, this isn't from my class, but this is uh, the kind of stuff that is out there. It's people making posters, and we had a whole conversation about whether or not people actually do QR codes. Mm -hmm. S signal to noise ratio, like, is it signal or is it noise? Mm -hmm. So making media activism is my favorite. Gordon Glover, thank you. Miles David Jewell, thank you. Megan Beecham, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>